2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast, the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian anarcho capitalist perspective. My name is Daniel and my co-host in Ro- is Robert. My co-host in Robert? That that's bizarre. I, I, I feel like since we're talking about Mission Impossible, it's going to be impossible for me to enunciate properly tonight. How are you doing, Robert? You're doing a great job so far, buddy. Keep it up. I believe in you. The listeners believe in you. You've done it before. You can do it again. In fact, doing great. we've done it 85 times before, and this is number 86. And that's if you're not counting the Reed Rothbard podcast, which we did years ago and has terrible audio. Hopefully this audio is better, and you can find the show notes and more, and including recent shows, at actualanarchy.com slash 86. Also, a bit of news, the Libertarian Union, of which we are a part, has now an updated website that will look eerily similar to Actual Anarchy. Because, well, if you've already got one kind of template going, why not use that same one? So that's what I did. And that's got a dozen other providers of content on there, including Foreign Policy Focus, Liberty Weekly, the Subversion Webcast, Battle for Liberty, uh, a bunch of others. So check that out, libertarianunion.com. Check out the new digs. Check out the new shows and all that good business. But, uh, Robert, you were going somewhere about, you know, me enunciating properly and, and all that. I was. You you sound great, Daniel. I just want to say that you sound like spectacular, sounding like so sexy right now. Well, I, I sent you that link to that Dan Carlin episode. Haven't listened to it yet. You did say play in the background and that it would be amazing if somebody did something into a movie about it. Yeah, it, it, it plays like a movie and it plays like so perfect for us to talk about. Like in the Martin Luther days, I didn't know about this, but apparently this is available information because books have been written about it. But it, it's all about these um, these Anabaptists and how these Anabaptists, all they basically, their big beef with the Baptists was that, you know, you got baptized, you know, against your will when you're a little baby. Oh, baptized raped. Okay. And they're like, you know, that's, that's not cool. That doesn't count, you know. So all these Anabaptists, you know, rejected their first baptism. And so then the Baptists came in. <laughs> And they would murder these people. And they'd, they'd say they'll give them their, their third baptism, which is they would strap them to a ladder and hold them under water until they died. And then the Anabaptists basically set up in this kind of end of the world kind of um, city of, I think, I believe it's Munster, Germany. And they start talking like there's this basically this preacher guy who's like who believes he's like, you know, a prophet, a super relevatory prophet. And he's got the word of God and the ear of God. And don't, don't they all? Don't they all? But it's so choice because I didn't know it goes back this far, but it kind of makes sense. But they start talking about how property is theft and how all, you know, money shouldn't exist and all people should live in a commune and all these, you know, basically communistic, socialistic ideas. And they start living in this city. And I forget exactly how it happened. I'll have to listen to it again or whatever. But apparently, you know, they kind of catch like the the anger of a local kind of like a the local I don't know duke I guess you'd call him and he brings his army there and, and he basically lays siege to the city so there's all these different conflicts in play about who's aggressing against who at any given time these crazy socialist communist ideas in their infancy but it's really kind of playing out again today and then the the crazy cult people, well, the Anabaptists, they're following this like messianic leader guy, and he starts going like off the rails. He starts like talking about how you know, well, now we need to um, now we need to have polygamy because God told me we need to have polygamy, and I need like all these wives, and they need to be like twelve years old. <laughs> and it just you know devolves from there. 
but the whole fucking show, I mean, Carlin does such an amazing job of telling the story that, I mean, I didn't know about all this, this communist stuff going back so early and having its ties to uh, Christianity. I mean, it kind of makes some sense, but you know, it's just uh, pretty amazing. I don't know if, if Marx knew about this stuff and he picked up on all this crap or if these are just popular ideas at the time or what, I don't know, but you should definitely listen to it. And I think everybody should listen to it. It was a really good episode. Well, perhaps you could uh, write a brief description uh, or a brief review and then we'll put it on the site with a link or an embed of the video. <sighs> The word brief involving this. Just what you told me. Just transcribe that shit. It's a four-hour episode. Right, but what I'm saying is you just present it as, I saw this thing, and here's the thing I just said about it, and here, now watch it. <laughs> Sounds more like a, like a Facebook post. Hey, has anybody heard this episode? These commies, these religious commies. Yeah. Dude, most of the content I write that I turn from Facebook debates into a Facebook post turns into an article later. It becomes the nugget, right? I build yeah. I build using the components that I have. I've been sharing a few pretty amazing ones with you lately, I think. Yeah, I don't I didn't get the context of some of those that recently recently that you sent me. Well, the one guy was saying you have to feed the people with propaganda. He was talking about Ronald Reagan and his quote, a lot of socialists have read Marx and Lenin. But if you understand Marx and Lenin, you'll be anti-socialist. Paraphrased. That's what Ronald Reagan said? Yes. Hmm. Okay. He had he had half-decent rhetoric. So the point being, if you've read it, but you don't quite understand economics or what they're really saying, it sounds reasonable. But if you understand it and understand that their ideas are stupid, then you would be against them. And that's his point. Fair point. And one of the guys told me to reread it because I didn't. He, he said, oh, you should reread this. Are you sure? And I was like, it makes perfect sense if you understand it. <laughs> it's like he set me up for that and then the other guy was like reagan was just full of propaganda to feed the masses and i said well in a socialist <laughs> a socialist society you got to feed him something because you can't make food <laughs> yeah you gotta feed him something good point you don't have food to feed him with feed him promises bullshit. and propaganda that's all you can do yep till they're dead anywho yeah um speaking of which yeah the, that uh that siege yeah in the in the show they uh they end up eating like you know, they dig up corpses at the end to eat. <laughs> they eat the dogs, the cats, the snails. It just devolves from there. It's uh, pretty gross. Anyway. Yeah, interesting. Well, hasta lasagna, don't get any on you. Hasta lasagna, yes. Thank you, Mr. Estevez. Poor Estevez. <laughs> Poor Estevez. I was really surprised. I, I did not recall that he was in this film. And then to he, see him die off so quickly, he he was he was funny. He, he had a solid bit for, you know, five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, he, he knew what he was doing. He'd been on the TVs before, and man, just a bit bit part. Poor Emilio. Oh, well. Oh, well. We'll get into it on the last nighters portion of the show, if you're ready, Robert. I think so. Let me check. Yep. And here we go. Doom, 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 doom. Hey everyone, it's Daniel and Robert, The Last Nighters, and here we are talking about Mission Impossible, the OG, not the not the series, but the movie, the original movie from 1996, because this Friday, Mission Impossible Fallout, the sixth in the series, comes out, and we thought we'd ride those coattails, and also harken back to our, our, our long ago past, back when we were in our prime, Robert and I, 1996, <laughs> and talk about Mission what Impossible. What are you talking about? <laughs> Speak for yourself, I'm only getting better, baby. That's right, you're aging like a fine wine. Or or a, a stinky cheese, if it were. No, the first thing you said. <laughs> uh, so this is The Last Nighters, episode 29. You can find these show notes and more at lastnighters.com slash 29. Also, the Libertarian Union is a, a part of what we are a part of, or vice versa, something like that. And that website has been updated. And also, you're now hearing us on the launchpadmedia.com, where they're always throwing new ideas in your direction. They have tons of exclusive content, great shows, uh, just a lot of a lot of fun stuff. And that's with um, put together by Johnny Rocket of Blast Off with Johnny Rocket. So check that out. Check out libertarianunion.com and check out lastnighters.com slash 29 for show notes and more. Moving on, continuing, let's do the Google description for Mission Impossible, if you choose to accept it, Robert. Let me check. Yes. All it's right. questionable. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Has there ever been a movie where they're just like, nah. Well, it wouldn't be much of a movie. Similarly, this isn't much of a show. So, you know, that works for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I haven't had a whole lot of time to ruminate about it since I just ended it. But, you know, it's fine. I've seen it before. Well, yeah. And what are you going to do? Ruminate while we're talking? 
<laughs> yeah, I'll ruminate while we're talking. I'll just tune you out and think about it. Normal style, missionary exactly. style for, for Robert on the Mission Impossible episode. Missionary Impossible style. That's good. <laughs> That's gold, Jerry. Yeah, baby. But let's get into it. Mission Impossible, 1996 thriller action film, one hour and 50 minutes, which, by the way, Robert discovered that it was longer than he expected because he literally just finished watching it. He hasn't even had tr- time to process his thoughts. So this is going to be raw, people. This is going to be Robert's like visceral response to the content. It's, it's, it's going to be the hottest of takes. So hot. Because it, it just, just happened to me. I've just been freshly traumatized, and I haven't had time to process anything. And it, it, it even feels longer than it is. I will throw that out there right now. But let's get into it. Sure. <laughs> All right. So 7.1 on the IMDb, 59% Metacritic, 62% Rotten Tomatoes, yet 88% of the Google users like it. This is Tom Cruise at his Tom Cruisiest. This is like the peak of his powers. So the description is, when U.S. government operative Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise, or as your cousin's wife would call him Tong Crew uh and his racist ma- <laughs> she says that literally that is that is exactly how she says that word so yeah I, it's just accuracy that's all it is it's just accuracy all right accuracy uh Jim Phelps played by John Voigt go on a covert assignment that takes a disastrous turn Jim is killed and Ethan becomes the prime murder suspect now a fugitive Hunt recruits brilliant hacker Marcellus Wallace and yes, Maverick Mar- pilot Mr. Marcellus Wallace <laughs> Franz Krieger, played by Jean Reno, to help him the professional, sne- the professional, to help him sneak into a heavily guarded CIA building to retrieve a confidential computer file that will prove his innocence. Came out May 22nd, 1996. Brian De Palma, box office, four and a half hundred million dollars. How do you say that? Four hundred fifty-seven million dollars on a on a budget of uh, under sixty million. So a pretty decent return for Tom Cruise and Paula Wagner producers. Your thoughts, Robert? Well. Wait a minute. How how does him stealing the knock list prove his innocence? I mean, ultimately it does, but just the act of him stealing it doesn't prove that he's innocent of anything. No, he's capable of or not 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 innocent of stealing the knock list. I don't know. Well, he um, he needs the knock list to yeah. to ferret out the mole and that Correct. and thus he needs prove it to ultimately innocence. prove his innocence. Yes, right. So okay, this is fine. this is I'll give, ultimate I'll, ends he's seeking here. Okay, I'll give the Google description a pass. Um, now this is made by Brian De Palma. I, who I associate with like 80s movies. So this is maybe towards the tail end of his career, unless he's still working and I don't know anything about the guy. But I thought he did a pretty good job. Um, This is definitely a more cerebral story than has happened later on in the series. I think they've just gotten more and more outrageous and outlandish with the stunts and whatnots. But well, this this movie I, I, features I, I some say, really Robert, good. There's there's a lot of stunt. Oh really? Are you going to say something? There's a lot of stunt action going on here. And in my reading, they actually had the yeah. action action sequences before they had a, a working script. They were just like, all right, we know we want to have a helicopter go into the channel. We know we want to like blow Tom Cruise's face with this huge fan. Like they knew <laughs> those major set pieces and the fish tank thing before they even knew the story, which. I found interesting. And fairly arbitrary. Like the fact that John Voigt's going to get helicoptered off of a train seemed like he could have gotten off of that train any number of ways. Or why did he have to get off while it was still moving? Why didn't he just have like a parachute? He could just get up on top of the train and let loose a parachute and maybe like fall off the train or something. I, I There's a million and one ways. You could like wrap him in bubble wrap and have him jump off the plane, train. I don't know. There's a million and one ways. But yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It's it seemed compared if you compare this movie to later Mission Impossibles, there's far less action and there's far more intrigue and double talk and subterfuge and that sort of thing. In this one, you mean? In this one, is compared to like part two or part three or part four. I mean, all I remember from part two is him like riding a motorcycle that has knobby tires and then smooth tires and then knobby tires and then smooth tires and then he wheel kicks some guy in the face. Then that's the end of the movie. Well, this is after him doing cliffhanger, right? Yeah, yeah. At the beginning, he's just doing uh, the cliffhanger where he jumps and without any kind of uh, ropes or anything. Right, just, and then they just freehand in it. He parodies that in Austin Powers Two, I believe, which was pretty well. Funny. This is the time of MTV when MTV Movie Awards were really a thing, and they were parodying it with uh, Ben Stiller, and that's a really funny bit. And uh, that was mostly Mission Impossible Two, where Ben Stiller pretends he's Tom Cruise's stunt double. I don't remember that. But that's real cute. Yeah, I'll try to find that, and I'll embed it in our show notes page because it is i do recall that being quite funny although that is about mission impossible 2 but still it's relevant we're talking about the whole series for the most part oh yeah yeah, well, a little bit. whatever we'll touch on each one a little but we're we're focused on the og 
For shizzle. All right, so I want to throw something out there at you. Okay. Before the even um, title scene, you've got a little like surveillance activity going on, and it's already confusing as fuck, right? There's like a struggle, and there's a woman on a bed, and there's a Russian guy, and they inject him with something, and they're trying to get a name. Meanwhile, the surveillance camera is like panning and moving around like it's being choreographed by a director of photography and not a surveillance camera. So that seemed weird. But were you confused? <laughs> um, I didn't opening? notice that. I was very confused at the very open, and and what it really has to do with anything. And then the, and then they're like in this like warehouse, and there was this fake hotel room, which makes no sense because wouldn't the guy, if if he thinks he's in a hotel room, how did he get there? Like, did he know he he wasn't in a hotel, or did they knock him out and then bring him there? That's what I don't get. Or did they have his? Yeah, did they have him have a a, a mask over his face? while they were taking him there. Yeah, who knows? Um, I, I thought the main opening scene was just to establish that Ethan Hunt is really good at wearing a mask and that, you know, these are the these are the toys that we're going to be playing with throughout the movie. You know, shortly after that, he gets the bubble gum. And what else did he ever, did he get any other toys? I forget. Uh, the spy glasses. And they had like little video watches. I mean, a lot of this stuff that they had in there, besides the laughable internet, uh, has come true. You know, like... I, <laughs> I now have like a little watch that I can, you know, see see video on or pictures of my kids, and track my steps, you know? I mean, that's sure. bleeding edge back in 96. You can get fit with one of those, I hear. Yeah, so um, bleeding edge back then. I mean, that was like, yeah, feature sci-fi tech. Yeah, yeah, and, and the laughable internet. But the whole premise of this is the knock list, which I forget the exact term what that stands for, but it's the aliases and the real names of CIA agents embedded in deep cover in foreign nations, investigating or entrapping people, mostly doing things that shouldn't be illegal. And if discovered, they would be killed. And so this knock list is going to be sold to the highest bidder to ferret out these embedded agents, right? That's pretty much the deal. Oh, well, one point of clarification is, is, is are the Mission Impossible people, are they... CIA agents, or do they work for a diff- the Mission Impossible Force? From my or is the Mission Impossible Force within the CIA? I think they're a separate thing, but they could be a unit of the CIA. Because that was not made clear. It seemed to be. It seemed like he worked for Krieger, and Krieger was his boss and whatnot, and they obviously worked in Langley. And But then why wouldn't? Why do they call themselves the Mission Impossible Force? I don't know. Well, it's IMF, okay. Impossible Missions Force. Yeah, there you go. Anyway. anyway. So yeah, they go after um, Max, who's an arms dealer. Who, I guess when you're just an illegal arms dealer, you're just not selling arms to the right people, I suppose, right? You mean like ISIS? You're, you're selling arms across treaties and across borders that, what? I mean, what are the, what, what's the difference between Max and like a, a representative like Raytheon? Well, one's more politically connected. That's kind of the difference. That's the entire difference. <laughs> the entire difference. So, did I lose you? I lost you. The entire difference. That was the entire difference. That one is in collusion with government and the other one is antagonistic to government and seeking a list to sell to the highest bidder to get rid of the nuisance that is government in, in you know, infringing on their business. Right. So, yeah. So let's talk about Max. I mean, she's obviously going to get the Mac, the knock list and then piecemeal sell it off right to different groups that would want to see impossible mission mission force agents or CIA agents in the field undercover operatives you know exposed or you know murdered killed whatever is but all it seems to be that she is i mean she's making a profit and she's doing it as a part of her business but she's also doing it defensively right because these are the people that are chasing after her to imprison her or hamper her legitimate business of selling arms to people that want to buy them yeah, I'd consider them an active threat to her and her livelihood. So yeah, Indeed. she's cleaning so, house, you know, getting rid of the rats. Yeah, you got some people coming after you. Probably going to act to defend yourself against them. I don't necessarily condone her, you know, actively murdering them, but maybe. I mean, if they're actively trying to, trying to, you know, lock her in a cage, or well, they're threatening her with her life. So I mean, the legitimacy of these laws is all just you know made up opinions and forced at the barrel of a gun. So I mean. With, you know, they talk about the legitimacy of laws and the rule of law as being legitimate. It's really just an opinion with a gun. Um, right. And so it's her, her, used her for political her. aims, of course, right? Like even later on when they want to put leverage against Ethan, they go after his family, his mom and uh, his uncle, and use the drug war as leverage against him. Yeah, that's right. They do. They have zero scruples when it comes to that. 
so they're just people acting with power to get what they want. Um, I don't know. What did you What did you think about the movie as a whole? I mean, did you enjoy this movie? I think that this is a movie that has a very convoluted plot, and some of it is just nonsensical, and so it kind of loses me. But then you've also got some very iconic scenes, like the spider drop scene, you know, where they're in the vault, and he's doing the, you know, the, the rappelling down, and the rat, like, interferes, and he almost drops, and they can't make a sound, and they can't increase the temperature, and all of those things. And then he's got that... Um, drip of sweat that's going to hit that pressure sensitive floor and the and the dude is like sick from being poisoned and he's puking and having to go to the bathroom and there's like all this tension building in that moment i felt that was pretty well done so there, there's moments that are good but i think overall it uh it kind of lacks cohesion and simplicity of understanding what's going on yeah this is a movie i don't think they would make today with the studios trying to make a lot of money internationally i don't think that a lot of international audiences especially with like translations and whatnot would have an easy time following the the nuances of the plot i just don't know i just don't know which was ving rames being like super cheesy about whether they can break in to the uh hack into the cia <laughs> Yeah, this isn't Ving Rhames' best performance, but, you know, it's all good. I thought I thought Tom Cruise did a really good job. Well, Cruise at his cruisiest, right? Yeah, I mean, he's... Though he, he, he does have this tendency to, like, overact, I think. He gets into it. I'll say that. Yeah. He gets into it, and maybe he overacts a little bit. But I'll take an actor that overacts a little bit over an actor that's underacting. Because like, at least you can like see the, the passion. Marcellus Wallace but, is basically just still Marcellus Wallace. This is, like, two years later, and he's, like, still doing the... He goes down in the in the fifth <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't get that Ving Rhames has got a whole lot of range. I mean, maybe I've only seen him, you know, a few times, but if they were just like, maybe Brian De Palma was just like, you know, that character you played in Pulp Fiction, just do that. Just do or that. that's your motivation. <laughs> or, just do that. Or, you know, that's just him doing him. Well, I think I he know. gets more personality as the series progresses. He gets to venture out and, and be like funnier. You know, he's like the jovial teddy bear. Now the grizzly bear. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true uh, as you develop his character over the series, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't really gotten into this series, so this isn't one of my favorite series. I, I really did enjoy this movie. Oh, you did? But Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. I got into it, man. Well into it. Had a good, fun time. All right, well, tell I really me. enjoyed the um, the scene between Cruz and Voight where Voight reveals that he's still alive and they're sitting in the coffee house and Hunt is putting it all together, what happened. That was really good. Yeah, yeah, and they were like different scenarios he was playing out like oh did did his wife blow up the car well Voight could have done it so then he like plays that little vignette because he's like he wants to like claire his um uh, Voight's wife he wants to yes. like see that she's innocent and of course at the end he tests her to find out if she's if she's uh in on the plot or not by doing the mask thing right that's like his uh that's like the thing the trope that they pull out in in this movie series that's his move yeah, it's a good move. If you pretend to be someone else from the neck. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I mean, he's you know, if he stood up, you'd go, wait a minute, John Voight's not that tiny. <laughs> but since he's kind of sitting down, you're like, okay, maybe it's him. Yeah. Now, before we go down this line of questioning, I just want to go back one, you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, back to Ving Rhames for just a moment. His computer sure. hacking skills, he is disavowed by the IMF, uh, but he allegedly did this amazing hack. And so Ethan's like, I need this guy. He's the guy I need. In the vault, all the hacking he does is know the guy's password by, I think, watching it on video, watching him type it in or doing a keystroke, um, you know, like a keystroke recording. That's that's the extent of his hacking. Yes. Yeah. The actually, yeah, that, that entire scene is more about the tension and Hunt, you know, being suspended there and less about, yeah, Ving Rhames' hacking ability. I mean, if you watch him on the, the train, when he, when he's jamming the signal of Max's signal, he just types in, send jamming signal. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's enter. <laughs> it's enter. I mean, I, I could probably do that. I don't know. Maybe. No, I get it. It's, oh, it's... you got to love 90s computer stuff. I mean, especially when the um, when Hunt is looking up on the internet. So, so good. Oh, yeah. He goes to like max.com or bibleverse.com yeah. and it's like, enter this page or enter this value, enter this value, enter this value. And then it's like this super long page load. Or when he gets the email, there's like this animation. Like it's almost, you've got mail. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how people used to get mail. There was like almost an animation when people had AOL back in the day. Yeah, it seems like not over, quite overkill, man. To that level, but yeah. Especially at those dial-up speeds back in the day. And oh, uh, I wanted to ask you, did you notice the brand of computer? Uh, it seemed to be briefcase brand. <laughs> I mean, it was huge, but no, no I didn't. All right, well, 
doing my research for the show, apparently it was Apple. And this really? was before they moved to their, you know, sleeker, silver, metallic design. And this was, you know, like hmm. 1995, 96, when they were shooting and, and premiering this movie. And I guess they had just posted like a $700 million loss. And so they wanted to get into this blockbuster thing as product placement to like try to rebuild their image. Well, I don't think it worked in this movie, but it definitely paid off at some point. I mean, probably just making a better product helped pay off. But, you know, this yeah. was a start. I suppose, well, although you, if, because I didn't even notice it. I don't know if that's good product placement or bad product placement. I remember the Diet Coke machine in the CIA headquarters. I remember that because it was like right smack dab in the middle of the screen. But I don't remember the Macintosh or the Apple computers. Yeah, yeah, it just looked like a black computer. Could have been anything at, at that point. But I was surprised that they weren't like super giant as I think laptops back in the 90s were. So they might have been top of the annual 686 chips, as Luther said. With the uh, artificial intelligence something or other. Right, the Craig computer. <laughs> some, some some made up jargon that they made up for, this, for that bit. I liked it. It was awesome. It was almost like we're going to science the science. We're going to tech the tech. I need that sweet, sweet 686 chip tech. I loved it. I loved it. I love that kind of crap. I love it when a writer has to invent some kind of thing that sounds impressive so that it'll it'll pass for, you know, it, the thing doesn't exist if it ever will. But as long as it sounds suitably impressive to your audience at the time, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine with it. You're totally happy. But for an audience, yeah, 22 years later, it's kind of funny. I just don't know. I just don't know. What did you think of uh, Cruz's magic trick with the disc? I thought that was kind of fun. It was like a fun little moment. God, I just watched recently a really good sleight of hand bit on uh, the Penn & Teller's Fool Us show where there was this dude doing this sleight of hand with coins and cards. And I, I really enjoy good sleight of hand. I mean, you know he's just like palming it somehow or holding it just out of view or whatever. But it's really skilled kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know if Cruz is like super good at it, but hell, you know to have a fun little ability that you could use in a movie. It's good stuff, man. I, I enjoyed it. It was a fun little bit. And I really appreciated the fact that he was just, you know, psychologically messing with the guy, that he actually did have the list all along. That was really fun. Yeah, I kind of did a psych, which I think was a prevalent thing to say at the time. You probably haven't heard that in about 20 years. Psych. <laughs> oh, that brings back memories. Good times. Now, one other thing that didn't, make a whole lot of sense to me. So the the team gets killed in Prague, or he thinks everyone gets killed. And then Kittredge, who is the CIA director guy, thinks that because Ethan is the only one still alive, then he must be the one who did it. Then he does the fish tank, you know, blow up thing with the gum to escape. And he goes back to the safe house that they had been using for the operation. Now, call me crazy. Was it the same place? Yes, it was the same place. He gets to the safe house. He picks up the chair that Voight had knocked over. He uses the computer that Voight had been using. He sees the Bible. He discovers the Job 314 thing. Right, right, right. And then he looks at the Bible again later and correlates it to the story that Voight had told him about being at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. So it's literally the same safe house. Well, it seems like Kittrick could have found him at the uh, safe house. Wouldn't he have a list of all the known safe houses? I think he would know like where the operation was going down. So yeah. And then he does the uh, the glass. You know, He breaks the, the bulb to have like an early warning of, that someone's approaching. Right. Totally useless. Totally ineffective. He's like hallucinating that it's uh, Voight and it's Claire, but she... Well, it's 4 a.m. I mean, he's tired. Right. He's but, just but had a very long day. She totally reaches him before he, uh, you know, then he pulls a gun on her. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you could nitpick this movie, but I appreciated that this, the writer of this story took the time, or it seemed to me, maybe you're right about them just having set pieces and wanting to, and you know, building a story around it. But it sure seemed to me that whoever was writing the story really enjoyed and had fun and played around with the subterfuge and who knows what at what time and what he does he know I know. And if, if he knows I know, you know, what do I say versus I got to play along like I don't know. So I got to give him some information and act like I don't know. I thought all that stuff was really, really cool. And I think that maybe they discovered, oh, wait, maybe more just action is good and that makes us more money and so we'll just do action movies because that plays better overseas so screw writers who cares <laughs> i just lament the days of a really good script i think those days are getting slowly lowly more and more behind us so you miss the loss of, of like good script writing quality writing yeah i mean i was i've been watching some billy wilder movies recently and that guy could write a script 
You had some amazing interactions between characters. The dialogue was great. Uh, just really tight, coherent script. And the way he would set up scenes where for the maximum emotional impact was just fantastic. And you, know, you just you get some of that. There's still, you know, we're still human beings and you still get, you know, a movie needs to have emotional impact and whatnot. You still get some of it. But in between all that is usually a whole lot of CGI and things exploding. And it's weird for me to complain about that since a long running joke of me is if there isn't, you know, robots or explosions in the movie, I'm not interested in watching it. But um, if you could marry the two somehow, maybe that would be the best movie ever. I don't know. Robots exploding and talking and having really good conversations at the same time. Yeah. The Matrix. That's why The Matrix is good. Yeah. That's the Terminator series. Is good. Oh, wait, it isn't. <laughs> Well, T2 is pretty good, and T1's all right. T2 is almost a masterpiece, and then everything after that is crap, crap on a stick. T1's still pretty good, although it's got some pretty bad stop motion. But what are you gonna do? It was like 1982 or something. Yeah, it's it's old. But... It's it's older than this. By the way, that's another thing I wanted to mention. This movie, the production value did not age very well, in my estimation. Well, that helicopter crash at the end was pretty pretty rough. That sure seemed like, hey, I got this idea. I want there to be like a helicopter blade right up against Tom Cruise's neck. That's that's the cool. That's going to be a cool like trailer shot and a cool like ad in a magazine. But it makes the super no sense. Like that train is going so fast. How is that helicopter catching up to that train? How is it able to fly in that tunnel? And then with that oncoming train, the other way train, how's that helicopter still in there? And still going that fast, keeping up with that train. And then how is John Voight able to just jump onto that helicopter and climb up onto the helicopter? No problem. I don't know. There's just a whole lot of issues that seemed like, well, okay, this is where it turns into a Hollywood movie. Right. And then Cruz puts the bubble gum on the helicopter and the explosion drives him toward back toward the train so he can like survive, which yeah. I don't think you can really plan that. I mean... <laughs> All right, here, I'm gonna blow no. That's when it was like cartoon. That was that was the cartoon moment. Here's the plan. Where I'm the... gonna blow it up. I'm gonna use the force of the explosion to propel me back to the train. Yeah, yeah. Good times. Yeah. So the production value didn't age very well, but this the concepts. I feel you could make the argument that they're speaking to today, like with Trump and the deep state and all that activity, because there is a speech near the end where uh, I think it's the 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 over the coffee that you were talking about with Voight revealing that he's still alive, where he says, and I think it's about, he's talking about Kittrick. He's trying to pin it on Kittrick, right? He's saying, hey man, the Cold War's over. The president, he thinks he's running things on his own now. We're obsolete. We're, we're left out to rot. And so we need to manufacture an enemy or come up with a reason to maintain our position. You know, it's the bureaucratic method, right? You can't solve the problem. You gotta continue the problem. And and then he even went into the... Um, the griping about how they're underpaid and underappreciated, like thankless and underpaid servants of the people to an unappreciative public. Did you get that kind of from his little speech where he's trying to come up with motivation for why Kittrick's the bad guy? Yeah, yeah, you get that he was actually talking about himself, but he was trying to yeah project that onto Kittrick since he was trying to pretend that Kittrick was the bad guy when it's actually him that's doing the whatever. Uh, yeah, it was good. I liked it. I mean, that's what people like the CIA do in association with the, the you know, the the arms contractors and whatnots. They, uh, you know, it's no it's no surprise that, you know, like Raytheon stock like jumped up um, really high, you know, at the start of the Iraq war and all the defense contractor stocks. I mean, they need constant conflict to justify their arms purchases and the, you know, the CIA, that's basically what they do around the world is they look after whatever interests of people that will work with them to get whatever they want, <clears throat> whether that's a war or who knows, whatever that, whatever it is they, that they're, they're asked to do these days. I don't know. Do they ask questions or do they just do the mission? I get the impression that they just do the mission. Yeah. I don't, I don't really know, but this was also an interesting time historically, like when this movie came out because the cold war had just ended. The Soviet Union had just collapsed. And it was really before a lot of the um, terrorism boogeyman stuff was going on. I mean, there was the, um, what was that, 1994, where the van um, blew trade up? Trade Center. Uh, yeah. The, uh, not the Trade Center bombing, but the um, Oklahoma City. Well, there was that also. But then uh, I think there was the Trade Center in the parking garage where the van blew up. Yeah, the first Trade Center bombing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was you know a few years right prior to this movie being made. But that still wasn't like, there wasn't the Osama bin Laden stuff, and there wasn't the ISIS stuff or any of that. You know, there was just, hey, the, the big boogeyman that we've had in the Cold War is now gone, and we're sort of flailing out here, like, what do we do? Like, wh why do they still have all of these agents embedded in all of these countries, you know? 
That war's over, man. Yeah, yeah. You got to keep the uh, if if you got CIA agents that are true believers, I assume you would need some kind of an enemy to keep them on board, also. Or at some point, you go, they start asking themselves, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? I assume that was pretty easy during the Cold War. But when you don't have a direct threat that has been ginned up, then yeah, you get people doing stuff like this, I suppose, or at least questioning, you know, what are we doing? Maybe I should start looking out for myself. I don't know. Well, yeah, and and it just goes to show us that, and, and granted it's a movie, but people do things that seek their interest, and it doesn't go away when they're quote-unquote public servants, right? They're still doing things that will benefit them directly. They need to justify to their higher-ups or to their budget meetings or whatever, like their reason for continuing to exist, or, well, even in, in addition to uh, increased budgets, staff, and power. It's a bureaucratic way. Certainly, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to grow your budget every year. And then if you got to make some stuff up or, you know, if you don't actually have work, you have to find work. And sometimes finding work involves creating work. So bad things happen. Bad people do bad stuff. I mean, you, you, you got trained killers running around trying to find conflict. If they can't find it, they create conflict. So, oh, lo, lo, and, behold, lo and behold, we found conflict. Imagine that. Indeed, so it justifies sir. their job as, you know, well, now I got to fight these people. I mean, how many times? I mean, weren't the Mujahideen, you know, on the side of the CIA? They were like, well, we're going to train up these Mujahideen in Afghanistan to give Russia, you know, a new Vietnam. I mean, that's what uh, the Grand Chess Board said, right? Yeah, it's a big new Brzezinski. Brzezinski. Yeah. Bog them down, so, wire them down, ex expend the Great Bears resources. Right. So, you know, and then there's no way that could ever come back to haunt you. It's all good. You know, everything's cool. I don't know what you're whining about, Daniel. Everything's fine. Everything is fine. All right. Well, this show will self-destruct in five seconds. Not really. Not really. We've, we've got a little bit more time. Do you have any other uh, ideas you want to explore um, before we get into our final summary and review? Why doesn't, uh, why doesn't the professional pull Tom Cruise up when he's hanging there for like five minutes doing the little flaily arm thing? And then why can Tom Cruise race up sometimes and then other times it's like really hard to hold them up? They're just creating the tension, baby. It's all in the hips. Yeah. Yeah. But it made no sense. It made zero sense. I mean, I understand they're just trying to make tension, but if it doesn't make sense, then you go, well, how did he, how did, what, what how? And then it just ruins it for me. It's still a good scene. Don't get me wrong, but. And it yeah, is iconic. Anyway. Like that's the, the one scene that everyone remembers from this movie is that vault. For sure. And yeah, I think that they pretty much replayed that scene in Ocean's Eleven, right? I mean, it's like almost a ripoff of that scene. Well, they are breaking into like a bank vault, but it's not a bank vault. It's in a casino right but you yeah. know it's the pressure sensitive you can't touch the floor i don't remember if there's oh, right. and beams and stuff but you know and they had a little uh chinese acrobat guy sure yeah grease man yep, yep oh yeah yeah that's another fun movie oceans 11 yeah it's just a ton of fun good really good writing just just a lot of good good script work fun premise you know robbing people it's always a good time yeah andy garcia actually andy garcia was kind of bad in that one he was a little bit too sleazy. He was like trying too hard to be <laughs> the villain, you know. Well, aren't they, are they aren't they just robbing like an evil capitalist in that movie? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Good, get them all. Yeah, expropriate that man. <laughs> That's not his money. He didn't earn it. Give it back to the workers. Yeah, exactly. And by workers, I mean us who are stealing it. <laughs> you see those coats over there? Go take them. That's right. They're just there. It's not like anybody needs an incentive to make more coats. There's enough coats for everybody. And of course, someone will make a coat factory and improve upon it if their coats just keep getting stolen. Why wouldn't you? I mean, your coats are just keep getting stolen. I mean, there's no profit involved, so you're just losing your shirt. The greater good. Just keep doing that. Why wouldn't you? If you don't like it, leave. Uh, so, so, Daniel. Social contract, Robert. The social contract. Yeah. You're good at saying words. All right. Well, let's get into the final summary and review. Okay, do it. All right. So, I pretty much shot my load earlier saying uh -oh. that I found this movie to be rather convoluted and obviously a set of action pieces where they tried to build a story around it. There was some good tension moments, which I appreciated. Uh, the internet was laughable. The skill set required from Ving Rhames was laughable. And yet the uh, the abilities of the helicopter pilot were amazing. Like, it seems ridiculous, like we were talking about how he could fly into this channel tunnel. And you would think that that would be like a difficult thing to do and he'd be like barely able to do it. But in one of the moments, he uses the blades to try to chop up Tom Cruise while he's still flying the thing until he like hits the tail rotor on the ceiling, which doesn't destroy the helicopter, by the way. He's just like bump, bump, bump. Oh, I, I better stop trying to saw blade Tom Cruise in half. But anyway, 
Uh, overall, it is entertaining if you sort of don't think too hard about the plot. And, you know, the, the Bible thing, I still don't understand, like, how that connection meant anything to him. He understood that it was a Bible verse and not Job 314, but I don't know how that really helps him. Maybe, maybe you can get into that in your final summary review. So overall, half decent for the time. It spawned a bunch of sequels that I think improved over time in their appeal to a wider audience, like you were saying, the international audience, bigger explosions. And Tom Cruise is famous for being a participant in most of his stunt work, which I got to give him credit for that. And he's also, he's like Dick Clark, man. He doesn't age. The guy looks the same now, which is pretty amazing. But I'm going to go with a 6.5 on this Mission Impossible and do check out the uh, the new one coming out on Friday, Mission Impossible Fallout. Robert, your turn. All right. Well, I, I like the movie a little bit better than Daniel liked it. Um, I didn't have as much of a problem with the story. I thought this movie was just a good fun time. Uh, the the issue with the Bible and you know the kind of convenience of him kind of looking up and going, oh, the, the Bible, John three fourteen. I wonder. I, I I didn't mind that at all. Um, I I the fact that that kind of led him to finding this max person and like f figuring out the email address to send it to i didn't like that so much but eh, you know i didn't i it definitely seemed like that there were a bunch of um set pieces that the movie wanted to do especially the helicopter thing at the end which i did not enjoy but i really did enjoy the the true honest tension scenes and the subterfuge scenes and the, the idea that, you know, Hunt is a really smart guy and he has to work hard to get what he wants and to figure things out. And he does it in an interesting way. And he's got this talent of impersonating people and, you know, wearing masks and making them look you know exactly like that person. And, you know, that he didn't know about Claire and he had to figure out Claire, but he knew everything else out. And the fact that both Voight and Hunt are not dummies. They're both really smart people and they're playing this really high stakes level of, you know, 4D chess. And that, if you can pull it off, you know, in a script, it's fantastic. I think it played really well. Um, maybe if you're not watching it super close or maybe it didn't work for you, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too enamored with it. Maybe I'm not really thinking about the flaws because I just got done watching it. But uh, I thought everybody did a really good job. At least at least Cruz, I really appreciated his performance in this film. And um, I, it's amazing that he's still doing it 22 years later and the fact that he's still doing his stunts. And maybe he's just a, a kid that doesn't want to grow up and he's just doing a great job and wants to run and play and do all the fun things. And bless his heart, he's doing he's doing it. I mean, maybe it's getting a little creepy now that he's like getting old and, he, and his co-stars are still like, you know, in their 20s and 30s. But yeah, you know, more power to him. Hopefully I'll be able to do that at his age. That'd be great. But um, yeah, I'm going to give this movie a 7.2. It's not, you know, super upper echelon. It hasn't aged super well, but it's still, it's really solid. And I really had a good time with it. Now, I might say that this is my favorite of the entire series. I've watched them all at various times and, you know, in various settings. And I, I have to say that I hated the hell out of Ghost Protocol. Um, I know that that's somebody's favorite, probably Mission Impossible movie. Uh, it's the one that Brad Bird did. Uh, I don't know. You know, Brad Bird's famous for doing The Incredibles, so he knows what he's doing. I don't know why that movie I just hated so much, but oh well. This movie was actually pretty good, so check it out if you haven't, or hopefully you did, and you uh, you enjoyed this one. Or you hated it, and maybe you agree more with Daniel. Either way, I mean, Daniel didn't hate it. He thought it was okay. Anyway, that'll do it for me. All right, so my, my number was 6.5, and uh, remind me, what was yours? 72, buddy. 7.2. All right. So not that big of a spread, actually. But uh... Yeah, no, I couldn't. I couldn't go higher than that. I mean, it's not an eight. Maybe back in the day, it was an eight. Maybe in 1996, it was an eight or an 8.2. But, you know, it the this, the production quality has aged a bit, like you said. There wasn't a whole lot to really chew on, you know, in this movie. No, I don't think it asked a lot of interesting questions. It didn't really bring up a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, it was, you know. We could talk about how how you know does the, the legitimacy of like nation states having like these secret agents that they send into other nation states and you know operate outside the laws of those nation states, but you know it's all illegitimate. So you know there's nothing really not a really interesting question there. I don't think. Right in our ideal society, it wouldn't this this story wouldn't exist. Yeah, I mean, these people just wouldn't have the incentive to do these things. Indeed, sir. Poor Emilio. I, I like Cutting him. room floor. He gets a bit part, gets murdered. Well, his foam head got stuffed up against the thing. Now, was that... Why did the elevator have the little spiky things that, like, propped down when 
somebody's head is about to approach them. Was that like a booby trap or was that supposed to be like, this is how elevators operate? They've got these crazy spikes that lay flat until something gets close and then they pop down. Yeah, that was the old uh, murder model elevator that was installed by the uh, elevator murder company. I really, yeah, that makes no sense. It really doesn't. Unless you were saying that, you know, John Voight somehow had installed murder prongs and knew that they were going to, he was going to be sitting on top of the elevator instead of off to the side. Which was the plan. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he had a backup plan, you know, that if he couldn't murder Emilio there, he was going to murder him, you know, at some other point. I don't know. Right. And, and Emilio was still like in a crouch position. Wouldn't you lay flat if you knew yeah. that the elevator was going up, up, up? Be like, all and right. If you saw prongs at the top, you could probably have laid off to the side and like avoided the prongs and the prongs would have plunged into the metal. And then, you know, he probably would have survived. Yeah. So another you know, nonsense. It's kind of like, like it's kind of like the old running away from the falling thing and you run straight away instead of off to the side where it falls. It's just dumb Hollywood thing. Yeah, so that must have been one of the, the things that they knew they wanted to have, whether it made sense or not. Like, all right, we got to have this elevator scene where these spikes pop down and it spears his head. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing it. You know, I can appreciate it. You got you got an idea for a scene you want to do and then you can wrap a story around it. I mean, to be honest, the, you know, some of those details aren't really super important. You know, the, the whole point of the story, I suppose, is, is, is Ethan Hunt, you know, clearing his name, I suppose. So as long as you got that, the details of exactly how it all happens or fill in the blank, how what do you want to do in terms of like action scenes or stunt scenes or set scenes or whatever right okay now the other thing that really bothered me now of course we're talking about the fucking movie but daniel when, when uh galatson was getting um murdered through the through the fence through the gate yeah the woman who was tracking him or watching him sees that he's being stabbed why does she get within knifing range of this murderer Who's on the other side? Well, of the skate? she she knew that there was a guy who was stabbing people, and she thought that it was cool. And she's like, "Well, I got to get in on this stabbing action, so I'm going to walk right up to the stabber and present my belly to him, you know, for convenience sake." I thought that was really considerate of her. Right, and then if there was another IMF team there, which Ethan discovered, and then when he's talking to Kittrich in the fishbowl, they were all there. Why did yeah. they not intervene in you know the murdering that was happening here? And wouldn't they have seen that it's not Tom Cruise doing the murdering? Yeah, you would see. Yeah, it sure seemed convenient that the other IMF team was, you know, I mean, John Voight, he must have been like a super, had this all super planned out. And it's not clear to me why he needed to murder everybody and then why he didn't murder Ethan. I'm not really sure clear on that. Why? What was his goal and what did he want? I mean, he wanted the money. He wanted the knock list, but he didn't know that it was a fake knock list. So was he, he was going to murder. He's going to have the professional murder the guy and take the disc the and then sell list. it to the girl. But why did he have to murder his whole team and pretend to be murdered himself? Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't make sense, okay. right? And then pinning it on yeah. Ethan doesn't make sense either because the other IMF agents were there and they saw that Ethan was running around trying to save people. Yeah. They saw yeah, I would think him they would not see, being the murderer. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, they did see him not being the murderer. I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I, I guess now that you make me think about the plot, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, why did John Voight have to murder the whole team? And then why not murder Ethan? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. And what? Yeah, why murder Ethan? seems like he got what he wanted, right? Right, yeah. He got the disc. He got the disc, and then he sold it to Max, and then Max gave him the money, or was going to give him the money as soon as the, the disc came up clean or whatever. So why couldn't he have just taken it from, I mean, I, I could see killing the guy with the disc, even though you probably don't have to, you could just knock him out and take it or whatever. But Well, he was stealing it to give it to someone, right? Was he? Wasn't he? He was, he, he was going to go give it to the stabber guy? Well, he was going to do something with it. Yeah, I wasn't clear on that, what was happening. They set up the, they were in the computer room. They went down the elevator. They were in the computer room. They set the eyeglasses to look at the screen. To see and then, him in the act of being at a terminal. That's being at a terminal and like, you know, pulling a disc out and putting it in his pocket. It's pretty and they're damning. just like, yeah, it's he's pretty, got it. It's pretty damning as evidence there. Well, he's got a disc and he's putting it in his pocket, Daniel. Of course, it's the knock list. All right. Don't question it. Now, the internet makes so, us all obsolete, well, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's all good times. Um, so then he's just kind of hanging out, having a smoke outside. And then he walks down the little street thing to the stabbing area and then yeah he walks up to the gate and he gets stabbed presumably I, walking up to the gate to give the disc to the guy on the other side of the gate yeah maybe so why be stabbed yeah why be stabbed and why kill all the other agents 
but only one of the teams, not the other team, and not Ethan, just everybody else, except for your wife, who's in on it, of course. Big reveal at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Would you care to revise well, your statement or your score? <laughs> well, no, now you're just making me question the whole plot, Daniel. Um, you needed time to I process. was just along for this fun ride, and now you're making me think it's not a good movie. Um, it's nah, fun. I'll leave my score as it is. It's fine. It's still, it's, a, it's still fun a fun movie. movie. Yeah, It doesn't make a lot of sense as to why things happened or why they needed to happen. Because, yeah, Voight never explains why he wanted to kill everybody, and Ethan never bothers to ask him. I mean, he has two face-to-faces with him, and he's never like, oh, by the way, why did you kill everybody? I mean, the one face-to-face he couldn't, because he was still pretending that he didn't know it was him. But the second time in the train, he could have said like, so uh, why'd you kill everybody? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, or even in that first sit-down, he could have been like, okay, if Kittrix is, is the guy, why is he killing people? Yeah, he could have played it like that. Could have played it like that. Because these people are, you know, they're IMF agents, right? If they're ever killed, it's completely disavowed. Like, we don't know these people. We don't know who they are. They're just some tourist who got killed in Prague or whatever. Yeah, it fell It's off never like, it's not like you're starting a war and creating an enemy, right? I mean, internally, you can be like, ooh, we got killed by a bunch of people and we're going to go after them and whatnot. But you can't necessarily accelerate that into a war. Not like, not like when, um, you know, there was that one killing of... Uh, who was it, a journalist or was it a, some CIA agent or some some secret agent in London recently? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I'm vaguely familiar with it, uh, like a poisoning or something. Yeah, it was poisoning. They made like it made some headlines, basically because you know everybody's like super anti-Russia right now, and I think it was like, insinuated that it was Russia that killed somebody, and they probably did. I mean, who knows? Governments kill people all the time. It's what they're best but at. They're really good at it, Daniel. If there's if they're good at anything, they're good at robbing and killing. <laughs> You know, pick a skill, I guess, develop it, you know, put your points, your level up points into something. Um, But in this case, in the movie, it's not, you know, all their activities are covered up. So when Ethan saves the day and whatever, all they said in the news was, you know, a helicopter lost whatever and crashed in a tunnel. It's not like exploited to be used as, you know, excuse to ramp up some kind of activity and to justify budgets and whatnot. I mean, internally, it probably is, of course, but not externally. I think you make this movie today and the helicopter is a terrorist attack on the train. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Terrorist attacked a plane today, flew a helicopter into a train. In a tunnel, which they shouldn't be able to fly in. <laughs> yeah. I wonder I wonder if, if, you, if any helicopter pilots would go, were just laughing during that whole scene. You could never, or, yeah, I could see you doing that. I don't even know if it's possible. Is, is there enough lift for a helicopter? Is there enough Is there enough air flow, you know, for it to do that in that enclosed area? And then to be operating at that kind of speed? I don't know what, what, what uh, turbulence, you know, what kind of air flows you need to operate a helicopter at those speeds. So I don't know if there's enough of that, you know, volume of air in that kind of space. I don't know. Right. And then but, the, um, you know, the helicopter's chasing them, right? And Ethan blows mm-hmm. it up, blows himself to the train. And then as it's crashing, it's still maintaining speed, apparently. And then the um, the train is stopping. Why did, the, why did the train stop? Because the helicopter blew up behind them. You would think that they would want to get the train away from the explosion. But they well, had to have the blade like almost get Ethan when the train finally stopped. Yeah, they needed that um, trailer moment. They needed the shot that was in the director's head that he's like, oh, yeah, that would be cool. I totally want that shot. Because it makes zero sense. The helicopter is crashing at the same speed, which with it was flying, which which with the the train, which is moving like super fast, it's like a super bullet train. And then yeah, the 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 train all of a sudden stops right when the helicopter starts crashing, and they stop at the exact same rate at which the helicopter loses speed. <laughs> makes no sense. Physics, baby. Yeah, physics. What are you physics? Physics. You anti science? Climate well, change denier? Well, listen, science isn't cool, okay? And they're in the cool business. And the cool business is a helicopter exploding and then the, the rotors of the helicopter coming up against Tom Cruise's throat. That is cool. I bet you that scene in the trailer made them about $12 million. In fact, that is actually really fucking cool. <laughs> I got to see this. <laughs> I got to see Tom Cruise almost get decapitated. I'm in. I'm buying my ticket. All right. Touche. Well played, sir. Mm. All right. Well, I need to wind this down. So I appreciate you joining me. And let's do the uh, Wild Wild Country with Tony Rockamora of Don't Waste Your Hate uh, for episode three. I think we're going to record that tomorrow. And it, it should come out on Sunday. So people can find that at libertyweekly.com net slash wwc and also check out this friday my appearance with 
Johnny Rocket on Blast Off with Johnny Rocket. And that'll come out Friday, July 27th, where we're doing an interview, hour and a half, lots of fun with him and his co-host, Raylene Lightheart. And that can be found at thelaunchpadmedia.com. Ooh, very nice. Indeed, sir. Well, thanks again. And uh, all right, fair enough. Well, I think that's going to do it for us on The Last Nighters. And uh, remember, you can find us at lastnighters.com slash 29 for the show notes and more. And you can also find us on the Launchpad Media, where they're always throwing new ideas in your direction. I uh, appreciate you guys joining us for the show and come back next week where we're going to talk about Daniel. Are we doing it? Which one? What are we doing? I forget what we landed on. What did we, what did we even consider? What were we considering? Well, it was between Detroit. I, I suggested Detroit and then you were su- suggesting Hungry Games. Mm, that is an interesting question. I don't actually know if I have Detroit available to me. Mm, well then. That kind of narrows it down, doesn't it? I think it does. So Hunger Games next week. I think we're going to focus on the first one, but we'll talk about the series in general. So Hunger Games next week, and I've got a really good article uh, put together by a friend of mine who's going to be posting for the site a little bit, some movie review type stuff. So look for that when we do the Hunger Games on the next episode. And I appreciate you guys joining us, and I'll say goodnight from last night. And we'll continue the transmission for a little bit longer on the Actual Anarchy podcast. The show notes and more for this version, actualanarchy.com slash 86. So, Robert. Yeah, buddy. show felt disjointed to me, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. (laughs) The knock list is safe. Democracy. This is a democracy the last time I checked, which was a total lie. I meant to bring that up in the... uh, show where they're you know talking about that senator guy in the beginning yeah 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 where he was like fly fishing and so they used his alias or his his identity as cover like ethan was right. attending that party as him yeah good stuff right i don't remember where they talk about democracy being a lie or alive or what no i say the democracy we are not a democracy the united what? states is a republic but they constantly say that it's a democracy they say it in the movie and they say it in the media all the time yes as if it was a good thing yeah it's in, true in fact i talked to a friend of mine uh, just over the weekend. And he was saying that he doesn't actually like the Constitution because it prevents the government from governing. It's too binding. He wants a more de- democratic system. And I was like, do you mean like a direct democracy where everyone votes on every single issue? It's like, no, we still have representatives, but you know, they do what we want or something like that. I, it didn't make a whole <laughs> lot of sense. <laughs> oh, yeah, just that system, that magical... Utopian system where the representatives do what we want, whatever we that we is. Who's we? Right. It's the 50.0001% apparently. And I I started bringing up to him, well, you know, there's a lot of really terrible things that a lot of people think are good. Like a lot of people support the minimum wage. Like 80% of people when polled say the minimum wage should be higher. Well, that's because they're economically illiterate. But if you had a direct democracy or this, um, you know, they, they do what we want. Well, then you're going to get a lot of people doing a lot of really dumb stuff. Well, in in the fact that 50.001% of the people want a thing, does it mean that that thing is a good thing or a moral thing? I mean, let's say that 50.1% of all the people took a vote right now and said, we want to murder Daniel. Does that make it okay? Yeah, yeah. I I, that, I think I brought that I mean, one up. And I also brought up that, you know, if, if you've got 51% voting to take from the 49%, He's like, well, that's pretty much what we do now. And that's exactly what we do now, except it's not the 49%. It's usually like the top 15% or the top 10% or the, I mean, everybody seems to be in favor of like taxing the hell out of the top 1%, who the already, whole 99% movement or whatever. Who already pay like over 60% of the taxes. And provide all the jobs and all the innovation. You know, it's, it's, it's good times. <laughs> Screw those people, right? What have they done for us lately? So let's, let's let's rob the most productive people in the world. That couldn't end badly. Let's let's disincentivize productivity and incentivize non-productivity. Sounds like a perfect plan. Indeed, sir. So that was a fun conversation. But anyway, uh, what else do you want to bring up before we wind down the actual Anarchy show and get into some Kathleen Turner Overdrive, where I actually have a story I want to share with you that is uh, for sensitive ears only. And by sensitive, I mean that you've ponied up a couple of bucks to support us on the Patreon. And you can do that at actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. No, let's do it, buddy. Let's let's wrap it up the show. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, sorry for this episode being so disjointed. This isn't normally how I like to do things, but I thought I could pull it off. And I didn't quite pull it off. So you can hate me forever, 
or you could join us back on the next episode and see if I redeem myself. Or you can just go, no, I still hate him. I want him to die. I'll hate him forever. Or at least for at least one more episode. So come back to see what happens. See you guys all next week when we take on the Hunger Games. Show notes and more for this episode can be found at actualanarchy.com slash 86. Thank you guys for joining us. We're going to get into some Kathleen Turner Overdrive right after this. Thank you very much. Good night. Maximum freedom, everyone. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do